Amerikanska priser ökar något mer än väntat. Det här visar färsk statistik från USA med oss för att diskutera den och inflationstrycket mer övergripande. Paul Donovan, you're a chief economist with UBS Global Wealth Management. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. We got slightly hotter than expected numbers out of the US just this uh, a moment ago. How much of a concern is this for markets? It shouldn't be a concern at all. I mean, these numbers are not very precise. I mean, you've got to remember a large part, in fact, a quarter of headline consumer price inflation is fantasy. It's it's made up numbers. It's not actually real world pricing. So uh, when we look at this, we get distortions, we get bits of noise, you get, you know, one price moves slightly differently. It's not something to fuss about. The general trend of inflationary pressures in the United States and indeed elsewhere is downwards. There's a general feeling, though, that inflation might not have come down, that the last mile is difficult to achieve and inflation isn't coming down quite as fast as some people would wish. But this doesn't matter. This doesn't add to that narrative, essentially. I don't think so. And I don't believe that there's a problem with the last mile on inflation, because if you look, for example, at regional inflation figures, you know, in, in several regions of the United States, inflation has come down a long way. If you look at certain sectors of the United States, I mean, the uh, the durable goods price inflation, so that's you know, the larger, more expensive consumer items, those prices have been negative falling prices for almost three years now. You know, this isn't a signal of some kind of problem bringing inflation down. It's perfectly possible to bring it down. You just get statistical quirks and a bit of noise that comes in from time to time. There is a feeling, a general feeling, well, more than a feeling, you have the 10-year-old, uh, the 10-year uh, rate in the US has been rising as of lately, and we've been scaling back the expectations of Fed easternings mm. in the last couple of days. Uh, how bad is that for market sentiment? So I think that the, the issue here is, um, shall we say, the, the communication issues around the Federal Reserve. Um, to be perfectly honest, I'm not a huge fan of Fed Chair Powell. I think he's he's done actually a pretty poor job. Um, and one of the problems here is he keeps going on about, well, we're data dependent. Mm -hmm. So what that means is every little twitch in any data item and everybody revises their Fed expectations because Powell keeps saying, I only look at the last figure that came out. Uh, and so, for example, we get the stronger employment report that we had, which may well be revised you know, next yeah. month. We may see this change all over again. And the market says, well, because the Fed reacts to the very last thing they ever saw, then that's going to be something which slows down the pace of, of rate cuts. Um, I think it was always unrealistic to be expecting half point moves in interest rates. Mm -hmm. um, the, the last half point move, frankly, was, was probably a policy mistake. But I think we will see a couple of quarter point reductions. So by the end of this year, we'll be another half percentage point lower in total. But a quarter point at the next two meetings is what I'd be looking for. That's, that leads us to obvious next question. Paul Donovan doesn't think that these CPI numbers are, are interesting, but does Jerome Powell? Um, I think he probably does. Um, I think that uh, he's put unnecessary emphasis on CPI. The rest of the Federal Reserve which is showing some distinct signs of rebellion. We mm -hmm. saw in the minutes that came out yesterday, you know, there's a lot of dissent against Powell and unusually public dissent. I think the rest of the Federal Reserve knows that the quality of CPI is not great. It's one of the weaker indicators of inflation. Things like the core PCE deflator, which is you know, traditionally the thing the Fed has focused on, that's been emphasized a lot more. It's very interesting that when the Fed economists write you know, things like uh, you know, the statements or, or the analysis, they really emphasize the PCE deflator. When Powell talks, he emphasizes CPI. And so there's sort of a battle of wills, I think, almost going on over what's the right way to measure inflation. Oh, you mentioned uh, a, a large uh, f fantasy part in this data. Is that fantasy part smaller in the PCA, if you look at PCA? It is. So it's, it's owner's equivalent rent, uh, which is a housing measure, which is a price absolutely no one in their life has ever, ever paid. You have to pretend you rent your own house from yourself and then you charge yourself a price. And it's, it's, it's complete nonsense. Um, it is in the PCE deflator, but it has a far smaller weight. Um, and if you look at the harmonized inflation measure, which adjusts US inflation 
sort of like the way we calculate it in Europe. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. That excludes this entirely. And that actually gives you a better indication of the inflation rate that homeowners are actually facing in the United States. Still, like it or not, we have a 10-year uh, yield around 4%. Uh, and markets, stock markets touching all-time highs. Yesterday was an all-time high. Again, I have a hard time seeing them rise at the same time. Should the stock market be more worried or more concerned about rates staying higher for longer? No, I don't think so, because this is a soft landing scenario, more or less. Yeah, there is a, a modest slowdown. We're not at the peaks of growth that we were at, but inflation is gradually coming down, and it's not appropriate as a monetary policy maker to ignore that. Central banks should be following inflation lower. Frankly, the Fed should have started this process back in May. Um, you know, the Riks Bank was actually quite good in, in cutting early in that process. The Fed's catching up now. That's actually a situation that is both positive for uh, equities or at least for earnings growth and it should be supportive for fixed income at the same time. So I don't have a problem with the idea that you know we're at around 4% so yields are, are well off their highs but will probably I think drift down a little bit as the Fed does continue to cut rates and the equity market is saying well you know the cost of capital is not too alarming and we've got a reasonable growth story so we've got a reasonable earnings story. It's not I think um, uh, problematic to see the sort of market reactions we're seeing today. How about oil price spikes? We haven't really seen that we've seen a, a little bit of it in recent days given the geopolitical angst that we do have that's a risk and it could also be an inflation trigger. How worried are you? So oil price spikes are always a risk. I mean, that's, that's always yeah. the case. Um, uh, you know, politics being what it is in the Middle East, you, you could obviously get something which pushes oil up. Um, is it an inflation worry? No, not really. Um, because uh, I think there's a couple of things we have to remember. Firstly, demand for oil is more price sensitive than it used to be. Yet now that we've got the ability to work flexibly, if the oil price starts going up too much, people are saying, well, I'm, I'm not going to drive to work. I'll do an extra day at home. Well, you spend an extra day working from home. That's, you know, a 20 percent reduction in your demand for oil right there. So that sort of thing is something which we we have to factor in. It's not as powerful as it used to be. Does raise the headline inflation numbers. But Central banks tend to look through that because the, the approach of most central banks is, look, yeah, oil's up today, it'll be down tomorrow. Uh, and therefore, you know, we shouldn't be changing policy just on a temporary spike. Only if you were to see serious problems emerging and say uh, wage claims or something like that after an oil price spike, then the central bank reacts. But otherwise, they tend to regard this as a, a temporary phenomenon, nothing to get too upset about. Will you be getting upset about future CPI numbers out of the US? So what's your what do you keep an eye on to, to follow inflation going forward? Uh, so I try and ignore the headline CPI as much as possible because it, I mean it's just too distorted. How about There's, a nice average? Well, even on an average, because you know, an average of distortions or an average of fantasy <laughs> is still a fantasy. Um, I tend to look in at the detail. So looking at the regional inflation numbers, looking at trends at individual price levels to get a sense of what's going on, that can be useful. Um, and that can give you a far better impression of uh, the level of genuine inflation pressures that exist in the economy. And that's a useful indicator to look at. I'm also paying attention to things like uh, wage costs, not the same thing as wages. There is a slight difference there. But you know, are wage cost pressures building? The answer at the moment is no, not really. Uh, and looking at things like producer prices, so that's further up the supply chain, to get a sense of, of where inflation pressures are and, and where inflation pressures aren't, which is also, of course, very important. Uh, and so taking a very, very broad approach is always a sensible strategy, particularly when you're looking at something as complicated as inflation pressures. Very nice. Paul Donovan, always a pleasure, always instructive. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming.